praise you for all that you are. Come and inhabit our praises right now, Jesus. I sing praises to you, your name. Praises to you, your name. The name that's so much higher than all names. All honor to your name. Honor to your name. The name that's so much greater than all names. Come on, sing it out. Be lifted up. Oh 
come and throne yourself on the praises of your people. All we want to do is worship you. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good you're good good. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, and let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, God, you are good. You're good. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh. You're never gonna let 
never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down sing it out you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me
like it's against me seems like it's put up a route against me put up a wall to deter me like Jesus is for me the creator of the universe is for me like I don't know where you're at this morning but maybe this morning you don't feel like anybody's for you you're not even for yourself knowing the person that you are sometimes and we need to step into that to say man there was something worth saving there was something worth redeeming that he sees something in me you know we we went through a class with Christine and Joey about our identity and that's to be honest that's the true thing that's released me to be the worshiper that I am today because I got a glimpse of what he saw I got to see my own image in my father's eyes as I worshiped him. And I said, there I am, God. There I am. That's the person I've been wanting to become all along. But it only happens in the place of intimacy. You have to come face to face with the father and put down all the masks, put down all the false identities that you've been running from and really embrace that, that there was something worth loving there was something we we can really identify with the sinner part but the saved by grace part we have a problem with because we all know we've fallen short in some part and that's the cool part is it's not by anything that you have done 
It's because of the choice that Jesus made. He said, I love something in you. I see something in you. I am for something in you. And to step into that, and to say, I leave this life behind because it's got nothing for me. It's got no truth, no true identity. You're just carbon copying somebody else in the world. You're just trying to fake it to be somebody else that's rich, famous, or popular. When really, the man who lived a life of submission, the man who lived a life of poverty, the man who lived a life of being poor in spirit, is the man who truly knows and wants to identify with you and make you great in who you were created to be. you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. Forever all my days I will love you 
God. God, I look to you. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. Boy, you know just what to do. this morning for this offering. We don't want to forget those who are dealing with cancer this morning. Churches and Jim and his family. Father, um, these offerings give us opportunity to support ministry, to encourage those who can't be here, but also to encourage those who may not know you. So Father, I just pray, Lord God, that um, as we take this offering, that you are glorified in our faithfulness as well as our faith in you. Thank you for loving us so, Father. In Jesus we pray. Amen. If you have an offering to bring, please bring it ahead.
Father, open our hearts today, Lord God, to hear what you have to say. You've heard what we've had to say. So, Father, I just pray that you help us to understand a truth today, Lord God, that I believe that could change anyone's life in this room. But more importantly, I guess I shouldn't have said it that way, Father, but more importantly, maybe at the moment for me, is that this is a message that needs to be shared throughout the world with our homes and with our neighbors, with our coworkers. We don't want to just sing that we love you. We want to share that we love you. And the greatest way to share that we love you is to tell people about you. And let us do that, Lord God, through your word and your ways today. We love you. In Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you for coming today. And thank you for those of you that are online who have the flu for staying home. I got a flu shot, but I don't want to take any chances. So thank you for that. We're in a series called I Disciple. It is a series designed to take this church to a new place. Uh, The hope is that by the end of next year, 100 of you will be discipling 100 of you. But I think that I've minimized it a little bit too much. I think we should look at it as 200 discipling 200. I can tell you're excited about that. That's exciting. Yeah, I appreciate it. I like to know that I'm all by myself here. That's okay. (laughs) We'll talk about that later. Um, But I'm excited about the the series. I'm excited about how we're going through the book of Luke. And I I love the kind of the things that God's uh, giving us. I do want to add one announcement on uh, January 31st. It's a Wednesday night. We're having a seasons night here, which is our uh, worship night and prayer. And uh, we believe that community is important, and we believe that is part of our community. So if you're a life group leader, uh, encourage your life group to be a part of that. And if you're not in a life group, you need to come be a part of a life group. And then so you, that was a joke. Uh, Well, not really, but uh, we we want you to be engaged in that. And so come on the 31st. It's 6 o'clock. We'll be worshiping for eight hours (laughs) with Brendan's gimpy hand. And uh, but did he tell you guys what he did? He was attacked by gorillas, <laughs> and he fought back as hard as he could. But and 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 you know he should have been thinking about us. Protect the hand, protect the hand. But no, his wife is saying, "Protect the face, protect the face. We don't care about the face. We don't care about the face. As long as you can sing, brother." Pray for him. He needs it. <laughs> this week we're going to look at the, the I don't want to say the doctrine of uh, the virgin birth, but that's really what we're going to talk about. Because I think that for the most part there are things that we know about the Bible that many of us just take for granted. Okay, yeah, I believe it. I really don't understand it or don't care to know it, but I believe it because the Bible says it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, I think there's, and there's some of you that like go so deep into it that you drive yourself crazy trying to figure out how this actually happened. And so today I'm just going to tell you that I'm not trying to prove to you that the virgin birth happened because it happened, right? So I can't help you with that. But, but I do want to be able to take this truth and teach you it in a way that might help you make a decision for Jesus today, but also might help you in the, your ability to be able to teach it to somebody who would have this question about the truth of the virgin birth. And so I spent the week studying this. Actually, I spent the first four days studying it, and then I just relaxed, and we'll talk about that too. But there's a lot of things we're going to talk about later today. (laughs) But as I study this out, there are five basic reasons why scholars believe the virgin birth is important. And the first one is the Bible teaches it. God says it's important, so that makes it important. And and I'm okay with that. I think that we should believe what God says because we don't know God like he knows himself. And so if God says it, that settles it, and that's kind of my style. Um, So I don't argue it a whole lot. But I I think that's kind of a minimalist view of the word of God. I think we've got to be wiser than that. Uh, But I do think there's a point to where if God says it, that's enough, and I'm good with that. And there's a lot of things in the Bible that are that way. People are always asking me questions. Well, what about this? Well, I don't know. God didn't say anything about that. So it would be me making it up 
And that's how culture started. And, and we don't want to do that, right? Just making sure. Don't know what kind of people I'm dealing with today. The second uh, reason the scholars, people much smarter than me, and maybe not smarter than you, but very much smarter than me, said that the, the second reason that we need to believe it's important is because of the deity of Christ. And the, the virgin birth is how God um, came to earth. It's, he came through a supernatural birth. And so it's important because Jesus had God indwell him, or God, he was God, so he had God come to earth. That's just the way he came, and so it's important for that reason. The third reason is the humanity of Christ. For Jesus to have to pay for sins in God's economy, he had to live in our mess. And so he had to kind of, to be able to be just as God is, he had to come live with us and experience what we've experienced. So we can't say, you don't get it, God. You ever say that to God? God, you just don't understand. You don't understand how hard it is. And God understands because he sent us Jesus through the virgin birth. The fourth reason the scholars said that it's important is because of the sinlessness of Christ. Meaning that if Jesus was born as a human, it would be impossible for him to be exempt from Adam's sin. And the act of being born without a sinful nature gives him the ability to be tempted without sinning, but also to be able to defeat death. Because the only way you can defeat death, because the wage of sin is death, is to be sinless. And Jesus was that. The fifth reason that the scholars believed it was important was the love of God. And literally meaning the birth of Jesus from its initiation to its completion is a picture of God loving us because God knew the only way for us to save ourselves from ourselves is if he did it for us because we couldn't do it on our own. And so literally God's love said, I got to figure out a way to save these people from their sin nature. And so that's the five reasons that uh, are basic. Um, now, I will be honest, I had 18 separate word documents of teachings on this. So when I study the scripture, what I do is I, I basically create a word document and I'll do two, three, four, five, six pages of handwritten and typed and cut and pasted scriptures and things. And I, I did this 18 times. Some were two pages long, some were six pages long. I studied this puppy out, man. I took it all the way. Now, the, the really scary thing is on Monday, I del accidentally deleted nine documents. <laughs> And so I had to start over. So I'm not sure if it's really 18 or if it's just 9 double, but it really wasn't a copy. It was recreating. Uh, so, so I did that. Um, I also had one whiteboard marked up in red, and I even suffered a, a red marker incident on my hand. It looked like Brendan's accident. So me and him can identify with the same kind of pain this week because, I mean, it was just bloodied all over the place. It was, it was hey, I did it for Jesus and you. I just want to tell you I love you enough to, to suffer the red marker incident. Um, I, uh, I had numerous post-it notes. I got frustrated on Tuesday morning, so I came down here uh, after the, the guys, and, and I came down here later in the day, and I just started writing thoughts and putting post-it notes all over the... I'll do that. I'll just pray up here, and I'll just put post-it notes. So if you ever smell glue, it's not... I'm not getting high here. I'm just putting <laughs> post-it notes down. And so there's post-it notes all over the place. And so if you find one, uh, I'll, I'll give you 10 bucks. But it's got to be my handwriting on it. Now you're all looking. Yeah. Tell you you're interested in church. <laughs> and I had trees of handwritten notes. Uh, I mean, those of you that are loggers, you're welcome. I, I did my part in, in, in using enough pulp to at least give one of you a job for a day. And uh, I, had, I had all this stuff. And, and about the middle of the week, I just called on a few people. Just, I had just randomly called the texted a couple of people and said, pray for me because I have so much stuff in my head, I don't know what to do with it. I mean, it was going to be like a college course on the virgin birth, and I know this about this congregation. Don't do that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I had all that stuff, and, and, and so when I, when I asked them to pray, I don't know, it was about 12 hours later, I'm just sitting there and I'm feverishly working on this for you guys. I'm laboring in the word and doctrine, but it wasn't labor like fun labor. It was like, this sucks. <laughs> and, and finally God said, why don't you just enjoy it? So I threw out all the docs and started over. <laughs> and this is what you get. So this is what you get when people pray for me. So <laughs> it's their fault, not me. Because what happens, I think, sometimes is we get so concerned about making sure we are right 
that we get so deep in it that we can't teach the truth in a way that somebody can say, okay, I can do something with this. So let me give you three things today, three simple things, because that's what I have done for the last 20 years, giving you three things every Sunday. <laughs> but there's no three sub points into three points. In the, anyway, you guys don't get preaching at all. So let me get, just give you the three things. The, the virgin birth is important because it deals with humanity. If you're going to want to be able to teach somebody the truth about the virgin birth, you have to recognize that the virgin birth deals with the idea of humanity. And I learned this. One of my Word documents was on DNA and how men with, are born with DNA passed down from an original source. And there was actually a study that was done this week that they said that they traced the original DNA back to the original, what they figured was Adam, but these are not God-believing scientists, but they did call it the Adam gene or something to that degree. Um, and, and so the, the idea is our fathers passed down DNA to us, and so we are who we are because of them. And from a sin standpoint, uh, Adam was our original source. So, <laughs> Adam was our original source. This is really going to play hard here in a little bit. Uh, our original source for the sin nature. So Adam's sin nature has been passed down throughout time to us, and it came to me through a man by the name of Kenny Roberts. And so I have his DNA who came from his father's DNA, who came from his father's DNA, who came from his father's DNA, all the way back to Adam. Now, I know someone's going to say, because there's enough male chauvinists in the room, <laughs> someone's going to say, but Eve did it. Well, let me help you with that real quick. Why is it passed down through the fathers? Because God told Adam personally, God said to Adam, do not eat of this tree. Then Adam told Eve, hey, by the way, we're not supposed to eat of that tree. Well, you know how women are. They never listen to you when you're talking about important things. <laughs> if there's a... <laughs> I told you I was going to buy that new motorcycle, honey. <laughs> but that's not how it works in God's economy. God holds the person responsible, responsible. And so Adam was responsible to make sure that Eve understood what God had said. And because he didn't, he is the one that the sin gene is passed down through. He's the one that's responsible. Um, and the scripture says this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And so what, Ad, what the scripture is teaching us that through this line of Adam, through our humanity, is passed down sin. The nature of sin or the nature to sin is passed down uh, uh, from our fathers, from our fathers, from our fathers, all the way uh, uh, down to us. And so our father's DNA carries with it, a sin, with it a sin gene that ends with a death scene. So the reality is, is that because of our sin, we will be separated from God for eternity because uh, that's just the, how, how it works with God. That's God's economy. And so my humanity on its own can't be free from the sin that's in me leaving me to live with me and to die with me because of the sin gene. Deep, right? The virgin birth is important because it will deal with humanity. The virgin birth is important because it deals with deity. Jesus was born nothing like me. His birth was different than me. He had a different kind of father. His father was God. God didn't, doesn't carry the sin gene, so he didn't have that in him. He had humanity in him from his mother, but he didn't have uh, the sin gene that was passed down from his father because he had a different father. So he was exempt from the sin gene. And pr Jesus proved this uh, in the fact that he never sinned. He proved that he didn't have the sin gene in the way that he lived his life. And so Peter said this, and Peter was an eyewitness of Jesus. Peter spent three years with Jesus, and he saw the truth of who Jesus was. Now, how many of you have been married like just three years? Uh, under three years. Under three years. Okay. How many of you have been married over three years? How many of you have stories about your spouse that you didn't know in the first three years that you know now? <laughs> Amen, right? The more you walk with them, the more you hang with them, the more the truth you find out about them. But the reality is, even in three years, those of you that have been married only three years, you've learned some things about your spouse that you never knew when you were writing out the, or when you were reading his Match.com profile. <laughs> right? So he, you're, you're a rocket scientist? <laughs> so 
The idea is Peter walked with Jesus. Peter spent three years with Jesus. 24-7 he was with Jesus. He was in Jesus, with Jesus in the most difficult times. He was, he was with Jesus in the most harsh times. He was with Jesus in the best times. He was in Jesus when he made wine, which would make all you winos happy. Uh, <laughs> see, y'all uncomfortable, right? I love making people uncomfortable. That's the most fun I have. So he was with him through everything. And so here's what Peter says about Jesus. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This isn't just some scriptural words. This is what Peter saw in Jesus. This is what he witnessed 24-7. This was the kind of person that Jesus was. And so this is what Peter saw when he, when he was just with Jesus. And I'll break it down a little bit simpler. Jesus was never deceptive. Jesus never, he never one time saw Jesus try to deceive somebody, to purposefully deceive them. He never one time saw Jesus manipulate somebody or try to control somebody. Jesus didn't have to manipulate. He, he, didn't, he never one time saw Jesus be dishonest. See, there was no deceit found in his mouth. He never saw Jesus ever not just being honest. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus said was honest. For that three and a half years, uh, Jesus was never defensive. He never felt like he needed to, to be, get defensive. The scripture says when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He never felt like he had to get defensive. He never got offended. You know what offense is? It's pride. So he never, you know, they said negative things about him and he never got all upset. He never got all butthurt. He never got uh, all, all, all offended. I've had people say that. He was never offensive. He never had to go on the offensive to protect himself. Jesus never, ever, ever, one time did, did Peter's ever, Peter ever see Jesus try to have to uh, be offensive to protect himself. That's just, so think about this guy. Jesus was never threatening, you know? You know? I, you know, the hard part about that is my belly comes out with my gut, with my chest. And, it's kind of what so happens when you turn 54. Shut up. <laughs> All you young guys with your washboard stomachs and your... Anyway, it'll go away. He was never frightened or frightening. He, you know, Jesus didn't just walk in the room and people went, Oh no, it's Jesus! Run! Run! They just didn't do that. He was never hostile. You know like you get when you're behind somebody, right, in your car... And you're like yelling and screaming, getting all hostile at this old lady that can't even see over her rear view. She can't see who's behind her. She's like looking through. It's like watching Susie Jackson drive. It's, it's right through the steering wheel. And if the steering wheel's right, and you're all hostile. Like they're doing it to you on purpose. This old lady's doing this to you on purpose. She, she gets in her car. In fact, I'm, as an old man, I'm going to do that. I'm going to purposely drive slow because I'm that kind of guy. I'm just going to do it. I, I, I probably won't be able to do it anyway. <laughs> See, Jesus was different than us. He was never deceptive, manipulative, or controlling, or, or dishonest. He was never defensive, offended, or offensive. He was never threatening, frightened, frightening, or hostile. See, it's not that Jesus' humanity wasn't tempted. It's that his deity protected him. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's why deity is so different than you and me. And that every temptation Jesus had was met with obedience to the word of God, literally meaning that Jesus surrendered the temptation of sin to sin to just trusting God. The virgin birth is important because it deals with humanity and our sin nature. And the virgin birth is important because it deals with deity and that God, Jesus didn't have that sin nature. So here's the point. The point of the red marker incident that damaged me forever. The virgin birth is important because it deals with reality. 
the reality is that I'm not God. Nor naturally does God indwell me. So I'm not going to be like Jesus. In my own, I'm going to be like me. I'm not going to be like deity. On my own, I can be... Well, let me back up and say, meaning this, that I, I'm on my own, I'm not good. I can work at being good. I can try to be good. But in the end of the day, in my humanity, I'm not always as good as I should be. I can be deceptive. I can be manipulative. Honey, if you really loved me, you would stop by the store and pick up pizza. <laughs> if you loved me. I can be dishonest. In my humanity, I can be defensive. I can be offended. And I can be offensive. Are you identifying with me with this? Or is it, am I the only human in this place that's this way? Or am I the only human in this place? That's a deeper question. I can be threatening. If you're an old lady in front of me and you, you will see the grill of that 79 Ford very clearly. Unless you don't have your glasses on, which is why you're driving so slow. So put your glasses on. <laughs> I can be frightened. I can be frightening. And I can even be hostile. Is that not the reality of us? That we try to be good. We try to be better. We try our hardest. But we have this sin nature that's in us that dictates to us some, some negative parts about us. Do you know that I can tr the reality is I can try to handle my life things without God, but in the end, I can't. I can't handle the results of my failures. I mean, I get it if you're young and you failed one time. You're like 18, you failed once. But when you're 54 and like failure is not just like, there's more failure than there's su success. At some point, you start to think about yourself and say, you're not as good as you thought you were when you were 18. I can't handle the results of my weaknesses. I, I don't like not being as strong as I think that I am in my head. I can't handle the results of my problems because I think I can solve my problems, but, you know, I'm getting into some problems that are beyond my ability to solve. Time no longer will solve the problems because I'm running out. I know, I'm only 54, but... I'd rather be 24. That sounded weird. <laughs> Do you know that I can't even handle the good things in my life? You want to know how messed up my humanity is? I struggle with compliments. I struggle with compliments. Somebody says something nice to me, and I'm thinking, why are they saying something nice to me, and how do I respond? Do I respond with, oh, yeah, that's because I am so perfect, or, or that sounded prideful, that sounded arrogant, that doesn't sound good. I had somebody yesterday send me a compliment. It was a very nice compliment. I didn't know how to respond. I was like, ah, it's, uh, because if I say, of course I'm that good. I mean, that wouldn't have sounded good, right? It would have been true, but of course it's, <laughs> you can't. Don't you struggle with compliments? I, I get stressed in times of peace. Right? There's like, there's got to be something wrong. Because if there's nothing wrong, there's something wrong that I just can't see. It's there, I just can't see it. And so I just get totally stressed at times of peace. Like, there's nothing going on, there's nothing wrong. There must be something wrong! In my humanity, I just figure, I start thinking about things that must be wrong. There must, there must be. There's got, because you, you can't just have good things happen. You can't, not in my humanity. In my humanity, if I'm not feeling pain, I'm fearing it. In my humanity, if I'm not feeling pain, I'm fearing it. I don't want to hurt. I don't like to hurt. It hurts to hurt. Are you with me? Am I all alone here? Because in my humanity, if I'm not feeling pain, I'm fearing it. I, 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 think, about, I think about people who have cancer, and I'm sorry. I, I, you're free from it, and then you, you just can't handle the, the good news is good, but then it comes with a caveat. But what if? That's our humanity. And that's the reality. 
you know I can try to have community outside of God, but in the end I'm alone? I was thinking about this. I can be surrounded by people like you who I think likes me. I, I think so. See, he nods his head, but I wonder, does he really? Am I he man? And I, and I, I don't, don't know if you know me very well, but I think you like me because if you don't like me, that see, since he's not in his head, but I don't know if it's really true or not. Because I can be surrounded by people who I think like me, and I can still feel like I'm all alone. Can you? You can be surrounded by people. And, and there's nobody in, I mean, why would you come to church if you didn't like me? If you, if, if you come to church because you like Brendan and you don't like me, then, then, then you should, be, should have left about 20 minutes ago. Because I, I would get that. I would understand that. Don't mess with the face. See, that's my humanity. In my humanity, I can have a loving wife and loving kids and a beautiful granddaughter and still feel like I'm all by myself. How screwed up is that? So why the virgin birth? Because it's the only way my humanity can experience deity. It's the only way I can have deity indwell my humanity so that I can live with my humanity in a way that, that gives me real life. Let me just read some scripture to you. Romans 3.20 For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. There's no, nothing you can do in your humanity that's going to deal with your sin on your own. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God, which is manifested apart from the law, in Jesus Christ, by the way, by the way, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, this is literally Jesus' deity and humanity coming together. And the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. And then it breaks down what happens at this moment. It says, for all have sinned, meaning that we and his humanity have all of sinned because of our birth father. So why is the virgin birth important? Because he was born differently than I was. He wasn't born with, with a father that had a sin nature. I was, and so I have sinned against God. Is that not true about you? Just as true as it is about me. And it's because of my sin that I've come short of the glory of God, meaning the glory meaning his presence. I can't have God in my life, in my own nature. By myself, I have my humanity. I do not have deity. I do not have what Jesus had. I have what I have that came from my Father. And we're justified by his grace as a gift, the scripture says. We're justified by his grace as a gift. Meaning we're offered a relationship with God out of love, and it costs us nothing. Which the, the humanity in you says, it must cost me something. No, it doesn't. It costs Jesus everything. It costs you nothing. No, it, nothing's that good. How do we get it? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, meaning what Jesus did in his humanity brought us back to the deity that sin separated. What Jesus did, and, and what, what, is it, what did he do? He gave his life on the cross to pay for our sins. His humanity died. His deity lived. But his humanity satisfied God for our sin. Can I just tell you something? Whom God put forward, the scripture says. This was, this was God's idea. This was God's idea to save you. This was God. The virgin birth was God's way to save you from your humanity. The way for God to save us from our sin nature was to send us Jesus Christ and have him sacrifice himself on the cross to pay for our sins and as a sinless uh, uh, human, sinless humanity. And he was able to do that because of his deity. And it was God's idea. And he did it as a propitiation, which is a wonderful word that I studied my guts out on. And it just means an atoning sacrifice that a sinless man would pay for a sinful man. If you've committed a sin, you can't pay the price for your sin uh, uh, to justify it with God. You have to have somebody who's never sinned pay the price. How was it paid? By his blood. Let's think about that for a moment. Was that the blood of deity or humanity that died? The blood of humanity. It's the death of humanity that gives us opportunity to experience deity. That's why the virgin birth is so important. 
1 Peter 1.18 says, knowing that you were ransomed, not knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not as perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, that like uh, that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And you know how you receive deity by faith? By faith in deity becoming humanity, and that through the crucifixion becomes our salvation. Where do we get that from? Grace. Again, it was God's idea to give it to us. It was God's idea to forgive us of our sins, but he had to find a way to do it to where it was, it was done justly and right. And he chose to do that through the life, birth, life, and death of Jesus Christ. See, you need to have faith that God provided a way through his deity, which was Jesus, for humanity to re be redeemed into a new reality. Because in my humanity, I have a sin nature. But through Jesus Christ and his deity, I now have a son nature. Let me give you the scripture. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And by the way, if you want to teach this to somebody about the virgin birth, these are the verses you need to know. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that, we might be received, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent his, the spirit of his son into what? Our hearts. Crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. When you trust what Jesus Christ did for us in his humanity through his deity. And we trust that his sacrifice satisfied God as a propitiation. Great big word. And we believe that God wants us to be forgiven of our sin nature. Deity then comes and indwells humanity. And so now I no longer have my father's nature from earth, but I have my Father's nature from heaven. Titus 3, 4 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. See, it's my sin nature that makes me struggle to be good. It's my sin nature that makes me unable to handle my failures, my weaknesses, and my problems. It's my sin nature that makes me always feel alone, though surrounded by love. And if my humanity never experiences deity, I am left with me. But when my huma humanity through Jesus meets deity, I am truly free. When God through Jesus indwells us by his spirit, my humanity dies and is buried and what I'm left with is him and his spirit's indwelling me. And when his spirit's indwelling me, I am good. With his spirit indwelling me, I am cared for. With his spirit indwelling me, I am loved. But if my humanity never meets deity, I am left with me. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 says this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you've received the spirit of adoption as sons. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. Papa. Daddy. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might be also glorified with him. How do I know that my humanity has experienced deity? You have a new daddy. Your old dad's dead with his sin nature. And you've been born again this time without the sin nature, but with a God nature. So you're no longer a slave to your sin, but a son of God. 
You're no longer a sinner, but a saint. You're no longer alone, but greatly loved. Because the God who put humanity and deity together in Jesus did so that the nature of our humanity inherited by our earthly father could be destroyed by the nature of deity inherited by his father. And without the virgin birth, I'm left to finish my days in my humanity without deity. And I will never be good. And I will never be comforted. And I will never feel valued or loved. But with a virgin birth, we have the opportunity to be indwelt by deity and be happy. So here comes the question. Who's your daddy? (laughs) Who's your daddy? You want to know why the virgin birth is important? Because if your daddy is humanity, you will die in your sins. But if through Jesus, deity is your daddy, your sins are forgiven. You have the ability to defeat sin. You're no longer a slave, but a son. How do you look at yourself? Do you look at yourself through the lens of, I'm a slave? Like, I have to go to church. I can't, I I have to do this. I have to. If you're looking at yourself like Christianity is slavery, you don't have the same daddy that I got. Because if God is your daddy, you're going to want to be where he is. You're going to want to worship him. You're going to want to learn more about him. You're going to have this desire to be crying out, Abba, Father, Papa, Papa. Now, I get it if humanity is your daddy. Why you would be different. Why you would be afraid. Why you'd be manipulative. Why you'd be scared. Why you'd be hostile. But you don't have to be any of that if God is your daddy. And if you're running around still dwelling on your sin, then he's not your daddy. Your daddy's still your daddy. If you keep looking at yourself through the lens of all the bad things you've done, he ain't looking at those things. He adopted you, and he said, hey, you just leave all that crap behind, and you just come, and you just climb up in my arms, and I'm just going to love on you, and I'm going to cover you. Listen, I'm your daddy now. You're not... You're not going to identify with that old dad. You're going to identify with the new dad who loves you and cares for you. And if you're feeling alone, it's probably because you got the wrong daddy. Because my heavenly father never leaves me nor forsakes me. No matter what I've ever done, he's never left me nor forsook me. Not at any point in time has he ever said, I'm done with you. I hate you. Get out of my house. He's never kicked me out of his home. I've left, yes, but I've always come back because I like that prodigal son. I want to come back to a father who I know is going to accept me and going to want me and going to love me and is going to have a party when I come back. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? As the worship team comes on up, I want you to stand with me, please. Who's your daddy? God had this plan all along to deal with your humanity. And it was done through the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, who brought deity and humanity together and became the perfect sacrifice for humanity to experience deity. Who's your daddy? Is God your father? Or is Kenny Roberts my father? Who's your daddy? See, I can't answer that for you. Why is the virgin birth so important? Because it dictates who my daddy is. Who's your daddy? Father, I love you and I love these people here and... I would hate to think that there's anyone in this room that would feel like you don't care about them and that you don't love them and you don't want them. Sending your only son to live on this crappy place with me and to have him be tempted like me but never sin, proving that he's different than me. 
And Father, for him to, to sacrifice his life, though he never did anything to deserve what I put him through. He dealt with my humanity on that cross, shedding his blood so that I didn't have to. Father, you loved me so much you gave me him and then gave me the opportunity to, through Jesus, have deity meet humanity. And I'll never forget the day when I trusted Christ as my Savior and I got a new daddy. One that no matter what would never die, would never leave me alone would never not forgive me for my wrongs. Thank you for being my papa. Father, be with the hearts of the people in this room. I don't know them. I don't know where they're at. I don't know what they need. I just know they need to choose a daddy today. Help them with that, Father. In Jesus we pray. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Would you do me a favor? If you would be honest with me and say, you know what, I don't know who my daddy is. I still think I'm connected to humanity. Would you raise your hand and say, I don't know who my daddy is. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Here's what I want you to do. I won't force you. Come talk to somebody in the front. Not right at the moment, but in a moment. I'll have you come forward. We'll teach you exactly what the scripture says about how he can become your father. And you can leave this place with a new nature. You can become a, a son or a daughter of God. You can be free from your sins. You can never, ever, ever have to experience loneliness ever again in your life. And know when you die because your daddy is God, you'll spend eternity with him. Now, I also wonder how many of you have been living as if your daddy was humanity and not deity. Some of you have been living your lives as if your daddy's the same daddy you've always had. You're getting offended and being defensive and you're acting as if God's not your father. And I think today you need to repent of that. You need to start living as if you're a child of the king. Father, be with their hearts today. If you need to settle things with your Father, come ahead. Come on. Come ahead to this altar. If you don't know who your daddy is, you come down in front and we'll introduce you to somebody who will show you who they are. If you're living as if you're not, your Father's not God, you need to come and repent of that. Maybe you just want to give God the glory for what He's your heavenly father has done for you. Why don't you just come? Father, they're a little stiff today and I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't believe there's ever a day in church we should ever not make decisions for you. As a father, I wonder if you're calling out to your sons and your daughters to come. come and be refreshed by a loving father to repent of being a prodigal son maybe you just want to have a party up here with them Lord God celebrate the work of Jesus Christ in our lives who has made us different all because of a virgin birth
daddy is the answer to the question of why the virgin birth. Can you share that? Because I think there's people this week that need to know that there's a heavenly father that loves them more than the earthly father ever could. No matter how good of an earthly father they may have had. There's a heavenly father that will change their very nature if they just get connected through Jesus. Father, I love you and I just thank you for this congregation. I thank you for you being so good. This is, to me, Father, this is an easy sell. It should not be hard for us to understand the the value of being a child of the King. And having deity indwell me through Jesus Christ. Who makes a new me. A different me. A better me than I ever imagined I'd be. And everyone in this room could have that if they get a new daddy. We love you, Father. In Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Stay in worship if you want. Otherwise, have a great Sunday afternoon. It's beautiful out. Enjoy. Enjoy.